you've been such a neighborhood advocate for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine you're pretty busy. So, um, Laura Hale, why don't we start with the One Good Deed Fund and tell us about the fund and how you're rising to the occasion during this special period. Sure. So I started the One Good Deed Fund in 2014. It's been just about like a month or two shy of, of six years. And I originally started it because I wanted to plant a garden for neighbors. I had their grandkids were helping me with my greenbelt garden and I knew that they would love one, but I didn't have the money to go out and buy a bunch of plants for someone else's greenbelt garden. So I was like, well, there's got to be a way to get these donated. And there wasn't, there was not a way to get it donated. Um, so I was like, well, this is really silly. Some you know, the city used to have some neighborhood funds, but those had dried up. So I did everything I could to stop myself from starting a nonprofit. I went to every community nonprofit I knew in Burlington and either people were going to charge a large percentage to be a fiscal sponsor or they lost their 501c3. Um, and I tried really hard to get someone else to do this, <laughs> like really hard, um, but no one bit. So I was like, well, I guess I'm starting a nonprofit. Uh, and so I got two of my friends who are also amazing advocates to be my board members and fundraised a whopping $800 to start and filed for 501c3. And within six months, we were giving out grants for people who wanted to do something nice for a neighbor in the old North End and didn't have the funding to do it. And what kind that, of projects, what kind of projects were they to start? So to start, like someone knew that a person who worked at the laundromat needed winter boots. And so we paid for the boots and someone else, um, gosh, we've done so many. Someone was helping their neighbor fix their car and we paid for the battery. Um, someone threw a neighborhood party and we played, we paid for a lot of the supplies. Um, it's been all over the place. Someone else got a little free library. Um, and actually my wife built it. So that was great. And it's now on North street. And if you see the bright yellow one, that's funded by the one good deed fund. Um, it's been all over. And then two years ago, I think we opened it up because we were getting a lot of requests from people who wanted to do something for like that was a neighborhood project, but wasn't specifically for someone else. So we opened up a opened up the grant so they could be neighborhood projects instead of just a one on one connection. And we have planted community gardens. It's been a, a bunch of stuff that's come up. Um, there's a lot of things we were going to do that have now been put on hold <laughs> because of Corona. So I ended up getting an email from our, our Facebook message from a neighbor on Saturday, last Saturday, a whole whopping week ago, which seems like a million years ago now. Doesn't it? And yeah, I just, I just can't even believe that there was a time before this now. And she messaged me and said, you know, if, if you started a relief fund, I would donate. And I just sort of sat at my desk and laughed. I'm like, no way. <laughs> That sounds terrible. No, uh, I am 100% sure that other people are going to step up. It's not going to be that bad. But at that point, only the colleges had closed, really. Like, it really hadn't hit. And then Sunday, I started seeing things really go downhill. And then on Monday, I was like, oh, crap, I got to start something. Like, we have funds in the One Good Deed Fund bank account, and they can't just sit there when people need them. And I emailed my board members, one of who was headed to Florida to pack up his mom and the other one who was working remotely and I was like, friends, here's something we really need to do. And they both were completely supportive. And Tuesday I wrote up the application and the giving guidelines and started some back end fundraising so we'd have enough money to give out. Had a conference call with my board members on Wednesday morning and then Wednesday afternoon we went live. And since Wednesday afternoon, I've given out $10,000, over a hundred grants. It has been a lot of work, but a lot of need, a lot and, of need. And can you, would you mind describing what kinds of requests? Oh yeah. So we, the way the one fund, the one good deed fund was already set up is we don't give money directly to people. We paid for, like we'd pay, if someone needed paint, we'd pay for the paint directly. We pay vendors directly for the, the services. So that's the way we're already set up. So that's how we kept going. So, um, well, I'd love to be able to just give people $100. That's just not the way we're incorporated with the IRS, and it would have been really difficult. So we've been getting grocery cards for people. The number one thing that people are asking for are grocery cards. 
Um, I have, like, I think the one good deed fund has personally financed like city market in Hannaford for like, the next month. Um, and so I am really, really up to date on which grocery stores you can buy gift cards for online and how fast they process them. And if they'll mail them directly, it is something I never thought I would know. Uh, we've paid a lot of utility bills. Um, I've paid Burlington Electric, Vermont Gas, Burlington Telecom bills. A lot of folks are asking for $100 to their rent. So I'm just cutting checks and sending them to their landlords with their information in it. Um, it's, been, it's been all over the place. And would you, how would you describe the folks that you're supporting? Are they people that are suddenly out of work or people for whom this is just the straw that breaks the back? Most people have been just out of work. Um, I'd say you probably like 70% folks who are just dealing with this for the first time. And then maybe 30% folks who have been doing this, like been struggling. And this was just the last bit. A lot of folks are, were working multiple restaurant jobs and sort of making do and living paycheck to paycheck, but doing fine. And then overnight they lost all of their jobs and they're panicked and rightfully so they thought that they had another like month of paychecks coming, you know, at least to make it through rent and food and folks just have no idea what to do. So a lot of folks I'm working with have unemployment that they've, you know, they've, they've applied for unemployment, but you know, unemployment's like, we can't process your request this week. We need to do it next week. So there are folks that are doing all the steps that they've been told to do. And they're still are like, I can't pay for groceries this week. You know, what am I going to do till I get unemployment? And that's exactly why I knew we needed to do the fund because I knew there would be that gap. You know, it, it, the, it, there's always a gap when someone needs something and when federal and state stuff kicks in, there just is. And how, what's the differential between what you've been able to give and the requests that you've gotten? I'm really clear in the application that we can do up to $100 right now. And that through the end of April, that's what we're going to be doing. And if there's more long-term need after that, we can figure it out from there. But my hope was to put this together as sort of a stopgap so that other funds and other organizations and state and federal funding could kick in afterward. I, I, I really hope by May we don't need to do this anymore because people have access and their jobs are back. But you know, it's evolving so quickly. I have no doubt that, you know, the folks who are getting $100 from me could easily use 1000 but I just don't have that kind of access to resources. I'm, I'm bringing in funds from donations just as fast as I'm giving them out. I, like, literally have a spreadsheet, and at the bottom of the spreadsheet is how much I've taken in versus how much I've given out, and, like, it's always down to, like, $4. Like, literally, as soon as it's coming in, it's going back out. So you're looking for donations as well as for applications. Yeah, both. That, yeah, absolutely. I will make sure we find a way to fill a need if it comes in. Um, people have been very generous. It's, you know, we've gotten everything from a couple of $5 donations up to a $1,000 donation. That was so great. Most of them in the $50 to $100 range. And that is, it's all, it's all so helpful. And literally, if someone sends me a PayPal or sends me a check, I'm getting it right back out to someone who needs it in a matter of 24 hours. And are you working with other agencies, funders, folks working in the neighborhood? How, how, how connected are you to the other things that are going on? I'm peripherally connected. Um, it is, these have been 12 hour days for me, um, right? I'm just literally me and a laptop and a phone trying to make it through everything and coming up with systems so that I'm not, you know, like I'm like, okay, now I write checks in the morning and I get gift cards in the afternoon just to have some sort of system. But um, I know mutual aid is just starting to come online in an organized way in Burlington. I just got an email about it this morning. So there are other groups that are starting to pick up that really haven't been able to so far. So I think this week, I, like, if you ask me this question next Monday, I have a feeling it'll be a very different answer than right now. Did you see that CETO set up the Resource and Recovery Center? I got, I, got, I got an email about that. Yes. It, where I saw the notice about it. I, I haven't heard from anyone there, so I'm not entirely. They have me up on their website as a resource, which is lovely, but I haven't heard from anyone at CEDO, so I have no idea how that's going to get connected. So as an activist in the neighborhood, uh, the Old North End is, mm -hmm. you know, certainly it's not the wealthiest neighborhood in the city. There's a lot of need structurally all the time. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about the implications? 
I can tell you, so this is the first time we've opened up the fund to all of Burlington. And that's because I knew that folks who are in restaurant and service work are everywhere. And I have seen, it's actually, it's been really surprising to me. It's been an equal distribution across the city of where requests have been coming in for. I think a little more in the old North End, but that's just because we have such dense rentals. Um, I'm really, really concerned about how this is going to shake out. I, I, I you know, I, I worked with someone who's out of prison and living in sober housing, it's halfway housing. He has to pay by the week and he had a job lined up and it got canceled. So he reached out to me and I'm, I paid like a week and a half of his rent. But if he gets kicked out, he goes back to prison, right? Like this is, I talked to another woman whose ex-partner pays child support as they should. And it's been all set up, but her ex lost their job and now she doesn't have child support, which she was counting on. So it's all these ripples that are going out. It, it's so connected in ways that people can't even see. I, I've seen so many people who are like, you know, my partner and I both are, you know, one of them's a teacher who teaches workshops and the other one's an artist or a musician and they've been making it work by piecing this all together. But now they're both, you know, getting, getting hosed on jobs and it's, it's gonna, it's bad it's really bad. It's a lot of people. And if you look at all these folks who are, you know, financially stable, thank goodness for it because they're going to have to be the ones to prop up a lot of folks for a long time. I saw my own work dry up in half literally overnight. And I'm just really lucky that I'm extremely cheap and that I've been, you know, saving some money that I, I'm going to be okay for a while. But this, the resources from the state and feds have got to come through fast because this is, this is bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm really worried. I'm worried about people going hungry. Yeah, and when you think about how much we depend, we're a service economy in Burlington yep. and in and Vermont. This yep. is really what we do. Yeah. This is incredibly disruptive. It is. And I know that a lot of folks are navigating these systems for the first time. Yeah. And that's, I, I've been trying to do what I can to help. But these are not systems that make you feel great about yourself. You know, these are systems that when you go into them, beat you down. So when you have folks that are already in crisis, feeling like they just lost everything and now they're dealing with unemployment for the first time or trying to get the like WIC or food stamps, they're just doubling down on feeling horrible. And, you know, a lot of us, a lot of my friends and I have been trying to shine a light on how broken these systems are for a long time. And this is what we were dreading. We were dreading seeing this overloaded. And, you know, I, 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 it makes me so sad. It just makes me so deeply sad that this is what it's taken for folks to realize that, yeah, schools have been rationing soap for a really long time. You know, a lot of kids eat at school because they don't have food at home. A lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck, and you wouldn't know it by looking at them, but there were three jobs. You know, I don't know a single person who has one job. You know, it's, it's, you know, everyone does something on the side, even if folks think they do. And the reality just wasn't apparent to people who weren't experiencing it. And I mean, I was the director of a network of free clinics throughout the state. And I was there during the rollout of the ACA and then the repeal of the ACA. And I saw that whole process. And meanwhile, we're just like, people are literally dying because they can't access healthcare. And that was the same fear. We're looking at it now being like, yep, this is what we saw coming and you can sound the alarm as much as you want, but until people actually see the crisis, they just, I just don't think they could picture it. I think it's just a, a confidence that when the worst happened that we'd all be ready. But if you've been slowly defunding all your systems for decades, you can't be. I think it's, I think it's, you know, I, I, it makes me really sad for the folks who thought that there was going to be a safety net for them and there isn't. Like you can't, I wrote this in a social media post, but it's the best way I can describe it. You know, if, if, if you get pushed out of a plane and you have a parachute, but you don't open the parachute until a few feet before you hit the ground, it's not going to save your life. It can be there the whole time, but you know, it's not going to matter. It, you got to have that parachute open as soon as you start to fall. And I think that that's the problem is we've kept just sticking these tiny band-aids on stuff for so long that we think, yeah, okay. There's food stamps if people get hungry without knowing 
you know, folks who've never had to use them don't know that you can't buy prepared food and you can't buy cleaning products and you can't buy diapers. It's all this stuff. You can literally buy like a few things with food stamps. And so there is this complacency that we have all of these things in place. And I think a lot of folks are shocked to see that it was never what they thought it was. Laura, I'm so grateful that you are there on the front line doing this work. It, uh, it may seem like it's small, but actually the One Good Deed Fund is doing really important connecting with people as much as giving out these donations. Thank you. So thank yeah. you very much. And yeah, um, it's a pleasure. Will you just remind folks if they would like to donate or they would like to apply, the best way to get in touch with you? Yep. So the best way is just through our website. It's onegooddeedfund.org. And I have a link to all the COVID-19 relief stuff right on the front page. Fantastic. That's great. So stay in touch with us. If there's anything you want to report, we're doing these shows daily. Great. And I really, it's great to see you. And you thanks too. so much. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Well, Zooming. <laughs> Zooming. <laughs> oh, I had one more question. Sure. All right. You said you've been working 12 hour days. Are you doing anything to relax? Uh, really, really bad sci-fi movies at night. They're, they're wonderful or cartoons. I'm a Bob's Burgers fan. And so just streaming the old seasons and knowing all the words coming out is the most relaxing thing. Although my wife will tell you that it's not relaxing for her. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably heard the same episodes like 10 times in a row now. And uh, yeah, my apologies. Our marriage hopefully is strong enough to get through this. <laughs> a little like the Rocky Horror Picture Show in the old days. Yep, yep. Yeah. It's comforting because you know it and it's funny and it's everyone is happy in the end and some days you just need that. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you too. Good luck with the rest of these. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. That was great.